Hello everyone and welcome to the latest Asian Carp Canada webinar. My name is Rebecca Schroeder and I work on the Asian Carp Program at the Invasive Species Centre. I will be your moderator today. The Invasive Species Centre is a non-profit organization that works to prevent the spread of invasive species in Canada and beyond. We work with Fisheries and Oceans Canada on the Asian Carp Canada Program where we provide resources, information and education on the prevention, early detection and response to Asian Carps. So before we get started today, there are a few items I would like to mention. First, if at any time you are experiencing technical difficulties, please send me an email by responding to your registration email and I will try my best to resolve it. Second, there's a brief survey following the webinar. If you could take a few minutes to fill it out, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. And lastly, we will have time for questions following the presentation today. So if at any time you think of a question you'd like to ask, please type it into the question box and I will read it to our speaker. Today's webinar focuses on outreach and education and is titled Asian Carps Education, Delivery, Challenges and Lessons Learned. And I am pleased to introduce our speaker, Shelby Heath. Shelby is the Education Liaison for the Invading Species Awareness Program. She has a background in environmental science and ecosystem management and has worked with conservation authorities and community-based organizations to promote and deliver stewardship initiatives and educate the public on environmental protection. Through these through these experiences, Shelby has developed a strong background in environmental communication and now uses her skills to deliver Asian carps and invasive species education to students across Ontario. So with that, I will pass it over to Shelby. Okay, hi. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Hello, thanks again, Rebecca, for that awesome introduction. My name is Shelby Heath. I am the Education Liaison for the Invading Species Awareness Program. And today, just going to be talking about Asian carps education, so how we deliver it in classrooms, some of the challenges we've experienced, and some of the lessons we have learned and are now able to take on in future education initiatives. So just quickly a little bit about me, uh, Rebecca did give a great introduction, but I have a background in environmental science, I uh, have some experience delivering education on a lot of different topics and passionate about environmental communication, so that led me to my role here at the Invading Species Awareness Program, and now I am in charge of traveling all over Ontario delivering invasive species education, Asian carps education to students. So a little bit of an overview about what I will be talking about today, just so you kind of know where we're going. A uh, little bit about the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, so one of the main stakeholders in this program, uh, our kind of office we are located in. The Invading Species Awareness Program, what it is, what we do, and the education program that is part of that. Uh, more specifically, focusing on Asian carp education, so how we deliver that, how we introduce the topic of Asian carp, as well as some example activities, so how we actually use them in the classroom, what we can do, so if there's any teachers who are interested, um, some activities that they can use to broach this topic. Some challenges that we have had with Asian carp education, so things that I have learned through my time in this role, as well as some lessons learned. So looking forward, how can we use this knowledge to uh, make Asian carp education more successful in Ontario? So the OFAH, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, really the kind of powerhouse behind this program. So we are the largest not-for-profit charitable fish and wildlife conservation organization in Ontario. So we have over 100,000 members spread all across Ontario, and we are really the voice of anglers and hunters, so trying to protect and enhance uh, hunting, fishing, and trapping opportunities in Ontario, um, providing knowledge, providing resources for hunters and fishermen across Ontario. So the Invading Species Awareness Program is a education awareness partnership between the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, as well as the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. This program was started in 1992. Um, one of the main focuses of the program is education and outreach, so really letting the public know about invasive species, uh, what they can do to help, some of the major pathways, so addressing those as well doing some early detection and monitoring initiatives. So our program EDMAPS, EDD MAPS, uh, that is kind of our early detection mapping system where you can create um, kind of reports of invasive species. So if you are out and about and you see invasive species, you can report one. So we have 
lots of great maps of different invasive species in Ontario. We also have our hotline, our invading species hotline, so the public can call in, ask any of their questions about invasive species, and we provide them with education and resources. We also have Hit Squad, which is uh, summer positions for students all across Ontario, where they get out into nature and actually do some invasive species management, do education. They work with our conservation authorities we partner with. Uh, we also do some trade shows. So we actually have staff at trade shows right now, headed all across Ontario, so talking to the public, some really in interested stakeholders like fishermen and hunters who may be dealing with these invasive species. So targeted outreach is really important for us. We want to make sure that we are getting to the people who are going to be most impacted by these invasive species um, and who are kind of responsible for some of those key pathways that we talked about. So boaters, recreational boaters, ATV users, trail users, even gardening. Um, so trying to get to some people there to address maybe invasive plants that are entering Ontario. So trying to address some of those key pathways is a big goal of what we do here at the Invading Species Awareness Program. All right, and here is our beautiful staff that we have here at the office. So a lot of great background, lots of great education uh, from our staff who do a lot of different roles from communication to terrestrial invasive species, aquatic invasive species, um, and we have a water soldier management um, project. So I am going to pass it off briefly to our aquatic program specialist, Brooke Schreier. He is just going to talk a bit about our role in particular, so Invading Species Awareness Program's role with Asian carps in Ontario and Canada and kind of our education and outreach goals. Hi everybody. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you right off the hop that these two fish, these two silver carp were not captured in Ontario waters. <laughs> so don't worry about that. That was actually down on the Illinois River uh, down outside of Chicago this past June. Um, so as Shelby said, I am the Aquatic Program Specialist with the Invading Species Awareness Program. Uh, so in my role, I'm kind of in charge of uh, our Asian carps outreach, our attendance at trade shows, uh, delivering Asian carps information, as well as the, the early detection piece. So our partnership with DFO started in 2013, and you know, given our given our membership, given our, our demographics, DFO recognized that you know we were one of the, the main stakeholders in this education. And so if you've never seen this before, this is kind of the four tiers that DFO uses to deal with the, the Asian carps situation. So they have prevention, which is focused on outreach research and the risk assessments. Then they have the early warning piece, which is focused on monitoring. And then they have their response and management pieces. So obviously the OFAH and the Invading Species Awareness Program slots into the first two, so in prevention and early warning. So as Shelby uh, highlighted, in terms of prevention, that's really focused on the education and outreach portion that we, that we deliver, everything from invadingspecies.com, to uh, edmaps.org slash Ontario, where people can report uh, Asian carps if they think they've uh, encountered one. So we have many different pieces um, and many different uh, avenues for education and outreach in terms of the prevention tier. And then moving on to the, the early warning piece, I'm sure you can probably put it together that um, through the hotline, so 1-800-563-7711, which is the Invading Species Hotline. Anybody can call at 9, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday to Friday and report um, uh, any Asian carp if they suspect that they've encountered one. Or, like I said, they can go to uh, admaps.org slash Ontario to report as well. So um, these are our numbers over the last you know, five, six years since our, our partnership was established with DFO. So these are strictly Asian carp phone calls. So somebody calling to report either a silver, big head, black, uh, or grass carp, or sometimes they, they don't really differentiate. Some people don't know that there's four different species, and they just say, I think I encountered an Asian carp. So this year we had 39 reports, and I'm happy to say that none of these were confirmed as Asian carp. Um, and you can, you can really see there that in 2015, 2016, we had a pretty huge spike in Asian carp reports, which most likely had to do with the media coverage that was going on that year. So with that said, I'll pass it back over to Shelby. All right. Thank you so much, Brooke, for that. So yeah, just showing you a bit more about our role with Asian carps, but now I'm going to be turning it to our education program. So 
telling a younger generation about Asian carps, giving them the tools and the resources they need to help us stop the spread of this invasive species. So the main goal, obviously, providing education on Asian carps as well as aquatic invasive species, invasive species in general, to students across Ontario and really making sure we're connecting to existing curriculum, which I will talk about in a little bit. So making sure we're making strong connections to existing kind of priorities in Ontario. We also have our target audience as students. So everywhere from kindergarten to grade 12, uh, we provide this program to all students and educators in Ontario. So really anyone who is in a school environment. So some of our main stakeholders, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, obviously really involved in this, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, as well as the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So, why did we need this education program? As Brooke said, it really ties into the kind of pillars of the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, their education and their outreach. So we recognized a gap in Asian carp education and we saw a really good opportunity with this new partnership with the DFO to really address this gap. So we focus on using existing resources. So we already have a grade four program called Making Waves, uh, which focuses on aquatic habitats. So that's a curriculum kit for grade four teachers. We also have a grade six curriculum kit, so Biodiversity Challenge, which as you can imagine, focuses on biodiversity. So we already had those two tools in our toolkit, but we really wanted to expand this program to include all students. So everyone from kindergarten all the way to grade 12, as this information is really important for all students. So as I said, invasive species education is now a really big part of the Ontario curriculum, and that is a fairly new development. Um, in the last you know, five, 10 years, we've seen a lot more interest and concern about invasive species, and it's now making its way into the Ontario curriculum. So we want to make sure that we are providing teachers with the resources, with the support that they need, so that when they get to that part of their you know, curriculum uh, requirements, that they are able to find the resources they need and make sure they're educating students in an effective way. So where do Asian carps fit into this? As we can see, lots of different connections to be made to Asian carps. So all the way from grade two, where we're just looking at air and water in a basic sense, grade four really focusing on habitat, so how that habitat can be affected. Grade six, biodiversity, so how that can be impacted by other species, as well, obviously, invasive species having really big impact on biodiversity in Ontario. Grade seven, we kind of shift gears and start looking more at human impact. So how we are affecting our environment, what are we doing? Um, so obviously invasive species, one of the main pathways is human introduction. So really making that connection for students that this invasive species problem is a human problem and that we are kind of responsible for doing our best to fix it. So also grade nine, again, looking at those human impacts and how we can maybe start to fix some of those issues. So preventing invasive species such as the Asian carps from entering Ontario. So lots of connections to be made to Asian carps. As we can see, lots of different places that we could fit this kind of curriculum in. And teachers really prefer that. They like when you're able to say, okay, you can put this into your habitat section. Maybe you make a connection to a different part that they were going to talk about in a different part of their lesson plan. So they really appreciate when you can make connections, when they can bring the things that we talked about in presentations back to a different part, make it even a stronger connection for students. So a bit about the structure of the program, so how this actually looks in a classroom. Well, it is offered from kindergarten to grade 12, as said, so it looks very different, but in general, uh, the presentation is up to about 100 minutes, and that's simply because that's what works best with school scheduling. Now they have a more balanced day, so they kind of have a 100-minute learning block, and then a break, nutrition break, and then another 100-minute learning block block and another break, so really breaking up the day for students, but I come in and I do typically 100 minutes of content, so usually starting out with a quick PowerPoint presentation, a good example on the right there of what my grade 9 presentation looks like, so really giving students a baseline, telling them what I'm hoping they will take away from this, giving them a good definition of an invasive species of Asian carp. What are they? What they look like? Um, then we do some specimen viewing. So this is a really important part of our education program is actually being able to bring some of these specimens into classrooms, show students what we've been talking about so they can make that connection. Again, they can take them, they can look at them, look at them from different angles. I point out some key ID features of these different species so that they can remember maybe next time they're out in the environment that they can recall some of those identification features. Also, as in all good education, activities to reinforce learning. So we really try and focus on 
fun games and activities that can get students thinking, get their minds working on using that knowledge that they just took from that very basic PowerPoint presentation, seeing the specimens, how it could actually look in a fun you know, way. They use that knowledge. So I travel to all schools in Ontario. I uh, have been all the way from Sudbury to London to Ottawa, everywhere in between. So that is a really cool part of this program. Uh, but we like to focus on the Great Lakes Basin. Obviously, with Asian carp education, uh, the Great Lakes are kind of our main area of concern. So we really want to target students in that area, make sure they have the education and the resources, because this could be the area where they might actually see an Asian carp. Hopefully not, but giving them those tools. I am a traveling road show, it's my favorite phrase to say. I bring all the required materials for my program. Um, so I have all my specimens, I bring the presentations, bring all the activities. All I require from the teachers is a computer and a projector, so that was really great for them. Minimal setup, minimal um, resources required, I pretty much bring everything that I need. So the best part of this program is that it is free thanks to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So teachers love that fact. Uh, they have limited budgets for field trips and traveling. So having someone like myself who can come in, give them that um, programming for free, um, be kind of an expert in the field of invasive species, makes it really appealing to these teachers. Uh, we've done some initial advertising through our social media, so letting the teachers know about this program, we took to our Facebook, our Twitter, Instagram, um, as you would imagine in this day and age, but we found that most effective was the email to school boards. So I would reach out to school boards in the area, send them a little uh, email kind of outlining what this program was, uh, what it would look like in a classroom, mentioning that it is a free program that really touches on that curriculum links that teachers are hoping to make. Um, so it, the emails were really our main form. They were the most successful way that we reached educators in Ontario. Uh, also an important thing to note uh, that I created a briefing note for educators. So obviously an initial email doesn't give you a ton of information on how this could look in a classroom. So I created for each grade in specific what this program would look like, how, you know, the timing, so again, presentation, specimen viewing, activities, and then breaking down what those activities were, the kind of learning goals of them, what the students would have learnt by the end of this program. So that really broke it down for teachers so they could see how this is going to look. Uh, but I also very importantly included a section about expectations. So as you can imagine, uh, a traveling program such as this makes it very difficult for an educator. You're going into a different classroom every day, maybe multiple classrooms a day. A completely new group of students, uh, the teacher you might have communicated only with via email. So making sure that you have kind of expectations in place of what you hope the teacher can provide for you, making sure that behavioral issues, any kind of things like that are kept under control and what you are going to provide them most importantly. So what you are going to have them be able to say at the end of the day their students have learned. Um, so that was a really important part of this program that we didn't have before. So I found that briefing note to be invaluable. We have the next one. Sorry. <laughs> Let me click to it. There we go. Okay. So, how do we even start to broach this topic of Asian carps in the classroom? As we know, um, they are not here in Ontario yet. So, it is somewhat tricky to kind of bring this topic up to students. They might have never seen one. They don't really understand, okay, it's not here yet. Why are we even worried about it? They can't really see those future issues that will arise with an Asian carp invasion. So that is something that we struggle with. So there's a real need to understand who you're talking to. As I said, a kindergarten class is going to be drastically different from a grade 12 class. So making sure you're using lots of visuals, so pictures of Asian carps, so they can start to familiarize themselves with that, as well as lots of activities that focus on them, which I will talk about in a bit. Also, we found that some entertaining images are ones that they might recognize. Uh, the silver carp jumping pictures are always ones that students can think about. You know, if I say, have you seen a picture of those jumping fish? They always re recognize that. And then so saying that's actually an invasive species. That's something that can stick with them. I've also found students really understand potential impact on humans better versus the you know, environmental impacts that we are all concerned with. Um, so maybe saying, okay, you might not be able to catch as many fish as you used to be, or maybe you aren't able to drive your boat around if there are silver carp jumping out of the water, or you know, a complete breakdown of our 
fisheries industry. So making those connections to human impact, while us as environmentalists, maybe we, that's not the first place we go, but it's important to understand that these children, that might be the thing that sticks with them. Also, uh, when I first bring up the idea of an Asian carp, first show a picture, a lot of students first jump to, oh, I've caught one of those, or I've seen that before. So making that distinction between similar species, so I uh, usually show a picture of a common carp versus an Asian carp, make sure they understand there are very similar looking species, and point out some of those key ID features, so that they know, yes, you may have, probably have not seen one or caught one, as they're not really established in Ontario yet, but making sure they have the tools that if that it did ever happen, they would be able to point it out. You know, we can't discredit the reports of even the younger generation, right? Still a really important um, kind of area we're trying to address. So we want to make sure they are confident with the tools that they have that they could distinguish between similar species. All right, so breaking it down even further into elementary, and my next slide will be more high school students. So uh, we usually have to simplify pretty significantly the idea of invasive species, uh, Asian carp, because it is a difficult topic for younger children to understand, right? This species that's coming in, taking over an environment not from here, there's a lot of different parts of that. So I like to compare Asian carp to bullies in nature. Uh, obviously in a school system, the idea of bullying is pretty uh, well understood among children that that's not something that we want, something where a species or you know a person is being mean to other things or taking more than they need. So comparing Asian carps to like bullies in nature, they hog resources from native species. Obviously a really big simplification, but something that students again make that emotional connection to. Also, as we mentioned, the curriculum links, we want to try and tie into those. So focusing on the needs of native animals, things like habitat, those water resources, showing how these invasive species can come in and start to remove those things. And again, that human connection, making it that humans are part of our environment. We are part of this um, habitat. We all have habitat. So making sure students understand that they are not separate from their environment. So telling them that these Asian carps and these invasive species will also affect them. Um, we also introduced the concept of a food web. That's a pretty big thing in elementary schools. So understanding what is eating what, what is getting eaten. Uh, have a picture up there on the top that shows you what I use. So obviously, again, a simplification, but showing you, okay, if we had a berry bush at the bottom of this food web and an invasive species removed it, how is that going to impact all the other species and then uh, students always understand okay well things that might have eaten that berry bush they might start to disappear and then the entire food web is going to be affected so they understand that this complex system very intertwined can be easily broken down by invasive species such as an asian carp coming in and removing parts of that we also look at impact on biodiversity. Again, kind of a difficult topic to introduce, but by grade six, that is something they are expected to be learning about in their science curriculum. So making it as simple as what would happen if we lost all of our native species. So these species we've had for a long time, what happens if we lose them? So what if we only had one type of fish, right? What if we only had one type of tree? So making it something where if an Asian carp did actually come in, this is something that could happen. You know, we could start to lose a lot of our native species. And I give them some time to really brainstorm about that, think about what that would actually look like, the effects that it would have. Um, and always a lot of talk about food webs, about trees especially. Maybe we don't have any oxygen to breathe anymore. So making it something that they can connect to. Um, and in high school, obviously, higher level of comprehension. So we dive pretty deep into Asian carps in that initial PowerPoint that I talked about. So we kind of do a little bit of a case study. So breaking down the issue into how these Asian carps ended up in North America. Why are they here? The human part of that. We were the ones who brought them here. Uh, the impacts they have, environmental impacts, social impacts, economic impacts, as well as identification. So again, making sure we're bringing up some of those similar species that they might have seen, giving them those distinctions. Um, so the identification really, it just breaks down into a simple uh, eyes below mouth or eyes in line with mouth for the big head and silver, the below the mouth, and then the eyes in line with the mouth for the grass carp and the black carp. While this may seem, you know, overly simple, uh, again, we don't want to overwhelm students with too much. 
fish identification is difficult, even as someone with an environmental science background. I found it overwhelming. So I don't want to overwhelm the students, give them too much information to the point where they just don't retain any of it. So keeping it simple with the eyes in line with the mouth or below the mouth versus a common carp who has their eyes on top of their head. I find students, they can remember that, that sticks with them. And maybe that's the key for them. You know, next time they're fishing with their parents, they remember that little hint for identifying Asian carps. Also in high school, we do some games such as Jeopardy and Kahoot, which is kind of an interactive quiz game uh, where we do very focused questions about, you know, how many types of Asian carps are there? How many different species? Uh, what are some of their impacts? and putting up a picture, what type of Asian carp is this? And students always do really well with that. They do remember the things that we talked about in the presentation. All right, so these are just some of the things that I do in the schools, just to kind of give you an idea of you know, how these lessons can be transferred into fun activities for students. Um, if there are any teachers, you know any teachers, these are great things that can be used in all classrooms across Ontario. So elementary students, again, simpler understanding. Uh, the one game that we do uh, focused on Asian carp is called Fridge Fiasco, where students imagine that an Asian carp has come in and taken all of the food out of the grocery store. They've eaten everything, left nothing on the shelf. So then I have students write down some of their favorite foods, what they would be looking for at the grocery store, put them in a big bin, kind of shake them up, and then go around and have students pick out some of the foods and they read them out. So, okay, we don't have any more apples. And then they can see that really emotional connection. Again, kids are very passionate about food. So if you start taking away some of those things and relating it to oh, the Asian carp came in and they took away all that food. And then eventually you maybe only have two or three things left in your bin. And then you can get students to kind of think about, okay, well, what could you actually make with this? What types of meals could you make with that? And usually very limited. So they understand that it's better to have that wide variety of food sources that we had at the beginning, but with things like Asian carbs, we can start to lose that variety and not have as many options. Another fun game for kind of any age range, I've done this from students in grade three all the way up to grade seven, is the ultimate invasive species. So this one is kind of adapted from our making waves curriculum kit that we had. Um, so we get students to think about what they already know about invasive species, some of these examples that we talked about, and we start talking about adaptations. That's another curriculum link that ties into grade four or five. So having students understand some of the features that these invasive species can have that can give them advantages, maybe big teeth, maybe they have fins, um, and they create their own ultimate invasive species. So they get to draw a species with five adaptations, um, kind of create its habitat. So again, making that curriculum link, um, telling me how they would invade Ontario. So start thinking of some of those examples of how we've actually seen invasive species invade Ontario or how they could be ending up here. So students get very creative with it. They think of those real life examples and always goes over very well with teachers. They have a really good time with that, but also remembering a lot of that invasive species knowledge they have. In high school, we get to do a bit more in depth. So we have a fun little game to kind of get students up and moving called What's at Risk? Um, based on rock, paper, scissors, which all students know. Um, so they start out as a native species, so the green card we have on the screen there. So things like our lake trout, American beaver, all these really important species in Ontario. And they have two paper clips. So these paper clips represent their resources, being able to find food, habitat, get all the things they need, the necessities of life. Um, and they go around playing rock, paper, scissors. So if they lose rock, paper, scissors, they lose one paper clip. If you lose both of those paper clips, you become an invasive species. So then you become this red card, an example we have up here, the Asian carp. So getting to see kind of what could happen. Um, and then as an invasive species, if you win rock, paper, scissors, you get to take two paper clips from the native species, the green cards. So a very uh, easy understanding for children, you know, invasive species have advantages. Asian carps could come in to our environment and start to take over quickly. Well, everyone started as a green native card. At the end of the game, we always have an entire classroom full of red cards so students can start to see how quickly invasive species can take over. As mentioned, Jeopardy and Kahoot are really great tools to facilitate learning uh, for older students. I find competitive games go over really well with the older students. They want to win. They want to beat their classmates. So they work really hard at making sure they're getting correct answers. So really making some focused questions on Asian carp identification, how they arrived in Ontario, the different species. 
So then uh, students are fueled by competition, but still really actively learning. Okay, so we also want to provide a lot of resources for teachers. As we said, we want to make sure that when they get to that point in their curriculum that they are able to maybe go online, find some resources that they can use to educate or have someone like myself come and give them that education. So on our website, invadingspecies.com, we have a lot of Asian carps resources um, that teachers can order for free, uh, have them sent to their school so they can get things like brochures, identification watch cards, um, lots of information that they can distribute to their students. We've also tried to focus on making some more kid-friendly products, so things like stickers um, that really show Asian carps, communicate that idea. Maybe students start to recognize that imagery next time they're out in nature, maybe they remember that sticker. Also, we have our quick reference guide, so lots of images, lots of information on various invasive species in Ontario, and teachers always really appreciate when I can bring those resources to them, uh, provide them with some stronger background. All right, so after I've sat here talking about this program for so long, has it actually been successful? Well, I'm very happy to say that yes, it has been successful. So since 2018, October, uh, that's when I started in this role, we have been able to talk to over 3,400 students uh, across Ontario, done a total of almost 130 presentations, been to over 150 classes, and worked with 126 teachers in Ontario. So that is really positive for us. We're very happy with those numbers and really great to be able to show that this uh, education, this programming is so desired and so wanted across Ontario. Uh, we always have more and more teachers asking for the programming. So really it's just a matter of scheduling, trying to make sure we can facilitate everyone. Uh, but yes, that's very uh, exciting for us. We've been able to work with over 12 different school boards. So making sure even if we can't reach everyone, we've been able to kind of talk to some people in that school board who can maybe give that information to others. So very positive response from the educators that we've worked for with. They see this program as very unique. There's nothing really else like it in Ontario, and it provides a very immersive and exciting experience for students. They get to see some specimens, they get to do some fun games, and have it come right to their classroom. Okay. So as I mentioned, I'm kind of a traveling road show. So I have been all over Ontario. Um, I have gone about 11,845 kilometers, so lots of time in the car. But as you can see, I have been able to access a lot of Ontario, talk to a lot of great students all over the place. So that can be things like planning multi-day trips to reach further areas, coordinating with teachers to try and make the most efficient trips that I can. But yes, really good to see that we've got a good spread around the Great Lakes Basin, while also getting some areas like Sudbury uh, that might not have received this type of education before. So how do we kind of quantify the success? How do we show at the end of the day to stakeholders such as the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters, how do we show them that this program has been such a success? Outside of the numbers, you could have gone to a million schools and not had a good program. So we want to make sure the program is actually good, the things we're delivering to teachers are effective. So I created a survey monkey presentation to send to teachers, just a quick little survey, about 11 questions that I just send a link in an email. So asking questions about why they wanted the presentation in the first place, how it relates to their existing class topics, their existing curriculum links. Uh, also really focusing on the priorities of teachers. So education, really, teachers are the forefront of that. They are the ones delivering this. So making sure we're aligning with their priorities, making sure the education we're giving them is beneficial to them, that it's not just something they can check a box, that they're able to use this education, this information in a relevant way. Also, we have a last part of the survey where teachers are able to give us uh, their thoughts on the program, talk about areas of, for improvement, maybe things that they would change, what were some of the strengths of the visit, so that can affect our future programming, how this program looks going forward. So uh, just some couple examples of the questions that I ask uh, from the survey. So we've had about 40 respondents, which is fairly uh, to be expected. We don't have 100% uh, response rate, but you know, 40 responses is a good amount of data to have. So we can see that a lot of the teachers wanted this program to support curriculum uh, and support those units of studies that they already had. There were some teachers who wanted it for fun, um, but yes, mainly we want to support that curriculum uh, that's already existing in Ontario. 
And uh, the most exciting one for me, uh, would you recommend this classroom visit to a colleague or would you book another presentation? So did you really enjoy this presentation? Was it effective for you? Would you recommend it to a friend? 100% uh, of respondents said yes. So that's very exciting for us. We can see that teachers really are enjoying this program and that they are getting a lot out of it and would recommend it to others as well. So just some challenges because that is kind of the point of this uh, webinar is to discuss some of the challenges we've had and also looking forward to some of the solutions that we have found for those challenges. So as I said, students really struggle to understand the threat of Asian carps because they've never really been personally affected by them. They've never, say, cut their foot on a zebra mussel or had a round goby on their fishing hook. So it's kind of hard for them to make that connection. So we have to use tools such as silver carp jumping videos or maybe some fun activities uh, that identifies the threat still, but in an entertaining way, in a way that they can keep a connection to. Identification, we've had to very much simplify um, because it is difficult to identify fish, especially as a species that isn't here yet that we can't bring in a live fish and show them. Um, so making it the eyes in line with the mouth, below the mouth, Showing them some similar species have been really effective in simplifying that identification, but still being effective in students being able to determine the different types of Asian carp. Also really important to adapt the delivery. So that has been the main part of my job is figuring out how to take the same information and make it applicable for a kindergarten class versus a grade 12 class, using those activities in tandem with the information to make it the most effective. Uh, you need to simplify the information to not overwhelm students because when they start feeling like they don't understand, I find a lot of students just shut down. They don't appreciate the education. They think this is too much for me. So making it something that they can appreciate, they can understand. Also using those existing tools that we have that are available to anyone in Ontario. So Making Waves and a Biodiversity Challenge have some great resources available on how to introduce some of these topics of invasive species, Asian carps, in a fun way to reinforce that learning. Okay, so some of the challenges, bigger picture with a program such as this, where it's just me, one person traveling all around Ontario delivering the education, obviously scheduling. There is a huge demand for this program, which is very, very exciting for us. Um, so we need to make sure that we're using resources efficiently, wisely, while also being able to meet, reach as many teachers as we possibly can. We want to make sure anyone who wants this education can receive it. So that becomes a struggle of scheduling, as well as just traveling. So uh, the traveling program, the transportation of materials has to be limited. I kind of carry everything in a bin from classroom to classroom. Um, so I have to be able to have resources that uh, don't take up too much space. I can keep all the activities with me, all my specimens with me. So that kind of limits um, the you know idea of the program. We have to be able to travel. Um, also traveling in itself, expensive. Uh, and you know, physically draining, uh, but it's been great working with the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. They really support the traveling of this program and the DFO, so they put a really good budget behind that. Also, teacher expectations, just managing that. Uh, sometimes I find teachers expect me to come in and just you know entertain the class for an hour uh, and a bit, but I have to re you know really tell them that this is an educational program, that we have goals that we're hoping to achieve, and we want to make sure that our times are being used efficiently. So outlining expectations, how they can help me and how I can help them. That briefing note was a really important tool for me um, that is effective to communicate with educators. All right, so at the end of the day, what are some of the lessons that we've learned about Asian carps education? What can we take moving forward, looking at future programming? Well, in-person education is really the best way to do it. Uh, we could, you know, we've looked into maybe doing some online resources, some webinar style things, but being in the classroom, being able to show students up close these specimens, talk about these species is very important. And the, you know, desire for Asian carp education is there and we're able to do it successfully in areas where it's needed. Um, so that's a very big positive of this program. Uh, another lesson, Asian cards are kind of a difficult topic to talk about with younger generations, but really simplifying it, highlighting the impact to humans and to the environment through games and activities is really successful. For younger students, obviously lots of fun games where the older students you can kind of sneak in more information while making uh, more competitive games like the Jeopardy and the Kahoot. 
Also, I think at the end of the day, my biggest point from this is that students need to be able to make an emotional connection. I am an environmental communicator by trade, so I really focus on making that emotional connection for students because that's what's going to stick with them. They have to be able to tell someone about it and be able to share that information, right? We're talking to one student, but maybe they go home and they tell their parents, they tell their siblings, they tell their grandmas, their grandpas. So we have to make sure that we're giving them the tools and we're giving them that information that they will remember so they can communicate it to even more people. So whether that be having a funny video of a silver carp jumping, maybe not the most educational, but still uh, making sure they understand those impacts. That's what our Great Lakes could look like potentially. Um, also the food web concept um, and just making the concept stick in fun games. All right, looking forward, I think this program is a great example of what Asian carp education could look like in Ontario and it's you know, need in Ontario. We have a lot of teachers interested in this, so it's a great example of how we could apply this to all of Ontario, uh, potentially through maybe collaborating with different educators. So maybe having multiple people across Ontario who could deliver this program, working with them, in order to enable all educators who want this program to receive it. Um, we're giving students the information that they need in a fun and engaging way, but also really relying on that scientific knowledge that we have to communicate those ideas. Uh, just in general, I think environmental education, Asian carp education specimens are a main tool for student understanding. They can see these things up close, see what we're talking about, and they really do enjoy that. And teachers always, that's their favorite part of the program. Also, students are interested. Uh, I think that's one of the main things I struggle with is that a lot of people think that students maybe don't care, they don't want to help, they aren't engaged in the process, but they very much are. Students are the kind of front line of our future, you know, struggle with Asian carp, they are the ones who might be feeling these impacts. So making sure they are prepared, they have the tools and the knowledge that they need, they are very receptive to it. It's just making it in a way where they are having fun, they're learning, and they have that really important emotional connection using those activities and those games to reinforce that learning. All right, well with that, uh, thank you so much everyone for tuning in to this webinar about Asian Carp's education. Hopefully uh, you have learned a little bit about what we have found in classrooms, what we see looking forward as potential areas for this program to go. Uh, if you need to find us anywhere, the Invading Species Awareness Program, we are at www.invadingspecies.com. Also have our email, info at invadingspecies.com. Uh, the 1-800 number there is our Invading Species Hotline. So if you do have any questions about invasive species, and you can also find us all over social media. So please feel free to connect with us there. We would love to talk to you about Asian carps and invading species. All right, I think that is all I have, if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, Shelby. Uh, that was a really great presentation, highlighting the amazing work that you're doing to bring Asian carp education to a lot of classrooms that are in Ontario. We saw how many you've gone to, which is crazy. Um, so we do have time for some questions, so please feel free to type them in now if you have any, and I've seen that a few have gone come through. Uh, I just want to clarify, Shelby, is Brooke still there? for questions? Yes, he is still here for okay. questions. Okay, because uh, I think a couple of them are, one of them is. So I'll okay. read um, This is from Robert Canning. Um, Brooke mentioned that there had been 39 reports of Asian carps made in Ontario in 2018-2019. What species of fish were those 39 reports correctly identified as? Were there certain fish most commonly misidentified as Asian carp, or was it just a random mix? That's a great question. And was that from Robert Canning, sorry? Yes. Well, first of all, hi, Robert. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for the great question. Um, there, we do have a kind of a list of species which are most commonly misidentified. So things like, you know, you, you could probably guess common carp is by far the most common species that's misidentified, mainly because it's a, you know, a member of the carp family. It's a fairly deep bodied, large fish. And some people aren't accustomed to seeing uh, that type of fish in their water. And particularly in the spring when these fish are, are going about their, their spawning habitat or going through their, their spawning rituals where they're kind of breaking the water, they're all kind of rolling around, they're, you know, in, in kind of shallower water, people are seeing them. That's when we get those, those reports of common carp, which then we, you know, we always take that opportunity to, to educate the public on the difference between the four Asian carp species and common carp. 
Um, besides that, you know, there, there are other things like gizzard shad, which is a kind of a silver fish, which does jump out of the water seasonally. So sometimes we'll get calls from people who say, I saw a silver fish jumping out of the water and I suspect it's a silver carp. Um, so most of the time it kind of coincides when, when gizzard shad are doing that. Um, besides that, you know, there are other uh, more, you know, smaller fish like, like creek chub, um, which are kind of, you know, the, that olive green color, which uh, kind of look like uh, a grass carp. Um, so there are quite a few species, and what I would encourage you to do is, I actually did a webinar uh, for Asian Carp Canada on the lookalike species of Asian Carps, and this is a, a few years ago, but if you go to the asiancarp.ca website, you, you could probably find that webinar and, uh, and take a listen. Thanks, Brooke. Um, I think the next one might be for you as well. Um, the question is, are natural waterfowl and aquatic predator spread vectors receiving any attention given the proximity of Asian carps? Ooh, um, Becca, can you repeat that question, sorry? I think, I think what's being asked is, um, are waterfowl and other aquatic predators that could potentially be predators of Asian carps um, being given attention or considered as a, a vector of spread? Um, so this is a question that came up. We were up in, in Sarnia this past week, um, and we did a, an expert panel on Asian carps, which Becca uh, hosted. And this question actually came up, and we were fortunate enough to have David, Dave Marson from Department of Fisheries and Oceans there to answer this question. And I think, you know, ultimately, you know, there, there are a number of vectors of spread for, for Asian carps, and obviously the main one is potentially through the electrical barriers which are found in the Chicago Sanitary Shipping Canal, which separate the Illinois watershed from Lake Michigan. And th that is the primary you know, uh, concern as far as the pathway for Asian carps into the Great Lakes. And there are other pathways, right? Everything from live release, which would be uh, obviously very illegal in Ontario, um, to the food trade, um, you know, Ill illegal importation for whatever reason. So there are a number of pathways, and I, I don't think that one has been looked at too closely. Um, but I also don't think it's, a, it's quite as high of a concern in terms of, you know, research and the effort going into these pathways. I don't think that one's very high up on the priority list. Thanks, Brooke. Um, the next question is for Shelby, and that is, do you know if there are similar educational or awareness programs in the United States? Oh, um, I haven't really found a ton. I think the struggle with education programs is kind of there's a lot of people trying to do the same thing. Um, I'm not sure of any really distinct uh, ones in the United States, but definitely I'm sure in different areas, conservation authorities are a really big source of invasive species education as well. So I would encourage you to try and look into that. Uh, but this program is pretty unique for Ontario. Uh, there are some similar programs in Canada, uh, but I'm not too sure about the United States. But yes, definitely check out uh, the United States, obviously not the same concept of a conservation authority as we have here in Ontario, but definitely some environmental protection groups, things like that. Could have resources like that, but none that I'm super aware of, no. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is, have your presentations changed classroom to classroom? So you mentioned <clears throat> that um, you had a few lessons learned, obviously, but how do you go about doing that? After one presentation, do you take into consideration some of the questions that you are getting and adapt it for the next one? Oh, yes, definitely. So, yeah, I think versus October to now, my presentation is completely different. It is night and day because it's obviously something you don't know until you're in the classroom. You start getting some common questions, right? Okay, well, what about this? Is it this species? And then I know what to focus on and also feedback from teachers, right? They say, oh, I would really appreciate if that connection could be made to habitat, right? Okay, well, I'll really focus on including that in my presentation. But yes, it's definitely been a learning experience equally for me as much as it has been for the students. So really adapting my presentations. I used to do quite a lot longer of a presentation, a little bit of a PowerPoint at the beginning because I really thought, you know, okay, students need to have that information. And they do, but it's also important to really focus on those activities and doing learning through those. So trying to break down those traditional ideas of learning that we might have had from, you know, when we were in school or from high school or university and trying to break those down so we can understand newer students, how they are learning, what's effective for them. 
So doing a lot of things like Kahoot. Like I didn't know what a Kahoot was before this year. They didn't have that when I was in high school. So really learning about that process, um, putting that together for students, things that they've already seen in their classroom, making that easier for them to connect to. So they know how to learn through that tool and then using things like that, where I didn't know about that until I was in a classroom and a teacher suggested I try using that. So yes, definitely been a great learning experience. This, uh, the presentations that I deliver now have dramatically changed from what I used to present, yes. Thanks. Uh, the next question is, what's your demand like to go to these classrooms and do you have to turn any classes away and how do you pick and choose where you go? Oh, great question. So demand, very high. Uh, had a lot of great feedback. But fortunately, I've been able to really keep up with the demand. Um, when I started this program, uh, when I started with the Invading Species Awareness Program in October, we had a wait list of about 150 teachers. So really significant amount of teachers who were wanting this education, who were still interested in receiving it, that we weren't able to accommodate in the previous year. So that was kind of my first priority, was getting to those teachers, making sure I scheduled them in first so that they could receive this because they'd already expressed interest in that. Um, and you know, I really had a bit of a time in February where I didn't have a ton of presentations, so I reached out to uh, kind of the Durham District School Board areas around that Great Lakes Basin where I talked about, um, so making sure that I was not going all over the place because I had done a lot of traveling. So I guess that was kind of how I shifted over time. In the fall, I was doing a lot of traveling. I was kind of gone every single week, all the way from Sudbury to, you know, Brantford to Ottawa, all the way around Ontario. So that is, as you can imagine, draining on an educator. So I had to kind of take a step back and start focusing on some more local uh, schools um, and educators, but there is still a lot of demand. Um, for this program, we have a wait list already started for the next year. So that's really positive for us, but we want to make sure that it's not getting too high. We don't want people, you know, being left hanging for not receiving that education. So uh, thankfully, I've been able to accommodate a lot of the requests, but still a really great demand for it. Yeah. So that looks like um, all the questions we have. If you awesome. do have more um, and you want to ask them, you can send me an email and I can get you in touch with Shelby. Um, so I just want to thank Shelby again for taking the time out of her very busy schedule to speak to us today. Um, and thank you for everyone who tuned in. I just wanted to mention again to please fill out the follow-up survey following this webinar. Uh, we really appreciate your feedback and it'll inform some future webinar decisions. We did record this webinar and as Brooke mentioned, we have um, the remainder of our series posted on our website. So if you are interested in checking that out, you can visit our website. Uh, to check out previous webinars and this one should be posted uh, later this afternoon or tomorrow morning. So thank you again to Shelby and uh, to Brooke for stopping by and thanks everyone for tuning in. Thanks, Becca. Thank you.